In this first segment, we want to welcome in the Secretary of Economic Development in West Virginia, Mitch Carmichael, former Senate president as well. Mitch, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. How are you this morning? Great to have you, sir. Always wonderful to hear your voice. Uh, It's great to be here. I love being with you all. So I have seen your job title listed no fewer than three different ways, Mitch. Mm -hmm. What is the actual official job title for your position? I'm the Cabinet Secretary for Economic Development in West Virginia. Okay. Why is that Why is that position never consistently referred to as you just said it? <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, I have not seen it uh, in various forms. Uh, but oh. uh, Google your you name. Know, it, it, <laughs> just Google yourself. <laughs> oh, Google the name? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's hard to tell what you would find. No. <laughs> <laughs> Only the good stuff, Mitch. Only the good stuff. <laughs> hey, let's talk about broadband in West yeah. Virginia. I know you just recently updated our uh, state officials on where we are with broadband and expanding the broadband internet service around the state through a variety of uh, ways. Can you give us the latest? Sure. Uh, as you know, uh Economic development, the Department of Economic Development, within its uh, group, uh, houses the Office of Broadband. So it's resp- I'm responsible for the Office of Broadband. And I feel really blessed to be in that role because my, a lot of my private sector background has been in technology and broadband expansion and so forth. And uh, until about 18 months ago, the legislature had never put any money into broadband expansion. Some of, there had been some federal programs that had come to West Virginia that had been, you know, t- terribly mismanaged. We're all aware of those uh, uh, bad reports on those programs. But now we have approximately, and the governor announced this plan, a billion dollar. Uh, initiative. Not all state money, obviously, uh, only about $100 million of state money, but then all the different federal programs. And we are, through our office, coordinating all those different elements and funding streams to ensure the following. This, this is the main point I want every West Virginian to know, is that we are all about reaching those who do not currently have broadband service. So, Every dollar that we spend is uh, utilized to help the private sector companies reach those uh, currently unserved West Virginians, of which there are about, I'm going to say about 60 to 70,000 addresses that do not have broadband, which when you say, you know, two and a half people per home, uh, you know, you're almost 200,000 West Virginians that do not have broadband service and that is in a state of 1.8 million people a little bit more than 10 percent of the population which is a tough number if you are going to have kids who during a pandemic must learn at home oh rob it, it, this uh it's perfect to have the economic development team manage the broadband deployment because it is critical for every aspect that we have in our 21st century economy from work at home initiatives to uh, research and education at home to uh, health care at home, uh, telehealth and so forth. Everything revolves around uh, broad, world-class broadband speeds and, uh, uh, you know, adaptability to the networks. And uh, so we're very focused on that. In fact, we've gotten all kinds of awards from federal uh, programs that have watched how West Virginia has stood up these uh, programs that we've put in place and have really, uh, done, we've done a really good job uh, in deploying these assets. I'm reading 3,000 miles of fiber line being um, strung mm-hmm. up in West Virginia. Is that an accurate amount, Mitch? Yes, that that is just currently, uh, since the program was initiated about 18 months ago. And you think about this, no programs had been in existence in West Virginia to deploy broadband assets on the government's from the government's perspective. So we stood up all these programs. We have four different aspects that help private sector uh, companies reach those unserved customers. And uh, we've got them in place. We've had to go through federal approval processes, grant agreements with the individual companies. And in that period of time, that short period of time, we've already – Uh, had four projects approved, uh, have been completed, have strung uh, or buried 3,000 miles of fiber, 
have passed now 38,000 new homes uh, or addresses in West Virginia that did not previously have broadband. And uh, so we're, we're well on our way to achieving uh, ubiquitous broadband delivery throughout West Virginia. And in regards to a completion date for this project, Mitch, does it ever complete? Is there ever a day no. when we've reached every person? Yeah, Rob, it's we're always, I think, going to find it, particularly in West Virginia, where, you know, you, we have such beautiful uh, – our broadband director, Kelly Workman, has a great phrase that says, you know, the more beautiful the state, the harder it is to uh, deploy broadband uh, assets because we have the hills and valleys and terrains and the, the wooded areas and the rural aspects. So it's hard to get to every location with fiber optic cable, but we're intent on doing it. We'll occasionally run into, you know, uh, the house at the very last, uh, you know, house on top of the hill uh, that we'll have to, we'll continue to go get those. But it is, uh, you know, um, it's our objective to get to every home in West Virginia with fiber optics. And does this include businesses, too, in those goals? Oh. Yes, sir. Uh, 100%. And, uh, you know, West Virginia is ranked uh, for all the great things that we do, we're currently doing um, and have achieved. We're still near the bottom in terms of uh, broadband availability and speeds, as well as the adoption rates within our uh, population. You know, just because it's available doesn't mean uh, that a customer has to take it, right? Uh, but there, the federal government also has what's called an affordable connectivity program that they will subsidize uh, customers based on certain criteria uh, up to $30 a month for um, uh, their Internet service. So, you know, you can get $30 off your uh, broadband bill um, if you meet certain criteria. And there's a website. We have a website, wvbroadband.com. You can go to that and find out all the information on these programs. We actually, Rob, our state should be very proud of what we're doing in terms of broadband delivery and deployment. It, we are really hitting this ball as good as any program we've ever deployed. John. Hi, Mitch. This is John Gilstrap. Um, hey, John. How are you? Great. The broadband is near and dear to my heart. I, I live along the Potomac in, in Berkeley County, and we haven't had, we still don't have broadband service. So the the state money, is is that, I understand it's being spent to, to bring broadband to every home, but are we talking about state money digging the trenches and, and I guess paying contractors to lay the cable, if that's what it's called anymore? Yeah. <laughs> It, essentially, the way we've structured these programs is th there was a there's a debate nationally uh, within you know, and each state can determine which way they want to go. Some states have decided we're going to own the internet. In other words, the the state's going to deploy the asset. They're going to manage the network. They're going to uh, own the infrastructure. And uh, our view on that, and I, I was very adamant about that, and the governor was as well to say. We don't want the government. Uh, we don't want you to say, I'm here from the government to help you with your Internet. It just doesn't work. So we wanted to create programs, John, that help the private sector, the people that do this every day for a living, extend their networks and to build off their existing networks, upgrade their networks so that uh, they can reach every customer. And the reason some of these clients and customers don't have Internet now is they're not a – cluster of homes in that area that would economically make it viable for the private sector to do it. So the state and federal government, mo most of this funding, John and Rob, is federal funding, uh, but we have to deploy the uh, programs and manage the programs, and, and I think we're just doing a fantastic job of getting to every home. And are the, the services like Starlink and other, you know, uh, satellite-based, yeah. uh, is, is that part of the program no. as well, or is it all real cable? All real fiber, in the, fiber. Uh, on the ground or on poles. And uh, we uh, and the feds uh, disallow this as well. Uh, we do not consider a home served with broadband if it's not terrestrial-based. So if it's uh, satellite, wireless, 
any of those technologies, we do not consider it served. So uh, our goal was to get fiber optic cable to every home in the uh, in the state and every address. And you know, there's nothing faster physically. <laughs> Uh, from a physics perspective than the speed of light. And so when we put fiber optics on those cables uh, or into those homes, we future-proof, uh, you know, any uh, technology changes and so forth. So we're we're really uh, leapfrogging our competitive, our surrounding states in terms of our broadband adoption and speed. So as it is now existing, as I understand it, existing developments that don't have broadband service, are in a position to negotiate with the uh, the service providers and then pay a fee to have the cable uh, mm-hmm. strung down into into the neighborhood and, and, and brought to houses. Uh, is that money badly spent at this point because the the public money is going to take care of it? The yeah, short answer is yes. Uh, it's uh, you know often we see and I'm very familiar with what you're speaking of. Uh, a customer will say, hey, I, I want broadband service. My neighbor has it. He's a mile from us. Uh, and then the provider will say, you know, it's going to cost us, you know, 10000 20000 30000 whatever, to run those cables and do the connections for you. And sometimes the customers will pay it. And, uh, you know, uh, our goal is to help uh, the private sector eliminate those additional build costs and just be able to uh, connect those uh, customers at the end of the line for no additional charges uh, and just hook them up as you would a regular customer. That's our objective and our goal, and we're largely, largely succeeding in this area. And how are the areas prioritized? Who Who is served first? I mean, great obviously, question. The- yep. Uh, it's a great question, uh, and it goes to the heart of our whole entire program is – uh, our objective is to reach the unserved. Often we get uh, applications from uh, Internet service providers that want to upgrade their existing service. You know, you may have, uh, you know, 100 megabit service, but you really want gigabit service. We're not going to help uh, the companies fund that structure. We're going to the unserved. And the way that we, you know, we have, we're already oversubscribed on our programs, John and Rob. So, The way we prioritize it is first um, uh, the lowest cost for the state taxpayer to get to the cluster of homes. So you can imagine uh, the first applications may be you know a two or three or four thousand dollar subsidy per home to reach those. But as you get further and further and further remote uh, out into the uh, uh, the further reaches of a network, the cost goes up. So uh, we, we're prioritizing um, the early adopters uh, and making the dollars spread as far as we can um, and then come back and, and pick up all those that we hadn't, uh, we didn't get on the first round. Is this a five-year program, 10-year program? Yeah, it's really to, for complete, ubiquitous, every home connected is, is more like a five-year initiative. But we want to get, you know, 80, 90 percent of our work done uh, much quicker than that. Uh, you know, the, the staff here at our office is constantly, you know, they know what I'm going to say when I walk into a meet. What hurdles have we uh, uh, encountered and how do we knock them down and get it done fast, quick, efficient? Uh, so we're pushing, pushing, pushing. It's, it is really a lot of fun, too. I mean, when you see people's... Um, that have not had access to broadband services or have had to drive to a, you know, a convenience store or a library or a, a you know, a fast food restaurant to receive the wireless uh, connectivity at those facilities. Uh, when you see them connected, it really makes a difference in their lives, and it, it's going to improve our economy, our education outcomes, our healthcare outcomes. You know, we view it as work that is uh, it, it's meaningful and uh, it's valuable and you know it's kind of a calling for our office and how about on the other side of it do you have service providers that are lining up to serve or are they kind of looking the other way when you when you approach no it's been amazing the, the first uh, an, the first initiative uh, in our 
uh, first entree into the programs and so forth, some of the providers were a little bit hesitant. But now they've seen how well these programs are administered, how well they're working, and they're lining up uh, to participate in our programs. And uh, we've got, you know, from Frontier to to Cast Cable to uh, you know, Comcast, to, yeah, there's about. 20 internet service providers in West Virginia, and I'll say without exception, they're all participating in the programs and very, now it's become competitive, you know, which is exactly what we want. Someone says, hey, I can get there before they can. Uh, uh, you know, one provider says, I can do it quicker than they can and, and less expensively, and that's what we wanted to uh, create, that competition, and it's it's working. And what is the commitment on for an area does the individual county yeah. commit on its own through its own board with a service provider for everybody in that county or how does that get broken up yeah it's gr another great question and it's uh based on cl it, it's more you think of a network doesn't recognize an internet service network doesn't recognize county borders or city borders or anything like that so the, what is the best way to get to those uh, homes within a geographic area is the way we look at it. It's the way the service providers look at it. What the individual county commissions or municipal governments often do is to contribute uh, some of their funds to the projects to make sure their citizens have access to broadband uh, uh, services. And so they go through the same process we do. We advise them. We have technical uh, team on staff to make sure that we're not duplicating resources. You know, as you can imagine, maybe a county has, you know, a million dollars they want to help uh, provide broadband to to uh, uh, John. And uh, so, uh, you know, but we say, hey, there's a better way to do it, or we've already spent money to get to uh, John's house. And so, uh that's the way we – that's the degree of coordination we have with all the different programs. Well, I, for one, look forward to the time that I can stream something from Netflix and actually see the whole picture, you know, where, no it, where it's not fuzzy. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, yeah, watch it without having to pause for two minutes as, as it catches up. That will be a very special night. It's going to be great. I mean, we are really moving forward on this program. And we're – you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to be on your program to talk about it because we're not highlighting enough uh, what we're doing um, in, in terms of the success we're having. Because if you go to a customer's home and see them uh, connected now for the first time, it is it makes a big difference, a huge difference, and uh, we're we're happy to play a part in it. Mitch, and it, go, if we go, John, you follow. Up. Are, are we getting to the point where we? we as the, the state can tell big developer X that in order to get your building permits, you have to hook up to the, the local broadband and, and provide it to the houses you're building and then shift that burden over from the government over to the developers as a proffer of sorts. Well, uh, I can see uh, maybe some local uh, uh, development authorities doing uh, something along those lines. That, that would be, it's within their purview. It's not something the state's going to push on them. But our goal is to make sure that it's available. Uh, one of the constraints of our program, uh, if an Internet service provider takes uh, some of our uh, funding to help deploy these assets, they have to commit to within 10 days of placing an order from any customer in that network territory, they have to hook, be able to hook them up and have uh, Internet service provided. So... You know, when we fund an area, a census block or a particular uh, area, anybody in that area can call that Internet service provider. And within 10 days, they have to be able to provide the service. Mitch Carmichael is our guest here on the program. Mitch, each morning uh, I do a, in the 6 o'clock hour, I do a little run through what happened on this date in history. And tomorrow marks the 154th anniversary of the driving of the Golden Spike in uh, the Utah Territory, connecting the nation's railroads mm -hmm. so that you can get from one end of the country to the next on a train. And it, it's... Uh, it's a great metaphor. It, it does. Yeah. It strikes me as yeah. quite the metaphor because yeah. the modern railroad system really is broadband Internet. It, that is such a great analogy that I'm going to steal it from you and you know that. Uh, that that is a great point and uh 
uh, couldn't be better said because that it's that connectivity that has made our society more prosperous and uh, made us the, a great nation that we are. And within my parents' lifetime, the TVA was bringing electricity yeah. to darkness. You know, it's yeah. The same thing uh, on a uh, a more connected scale, and uh, so yeah, that's um, that. You know what? I'm go I'm going to convey that to our staff here today because that that underscores the importance of what we're doing, the work that we're doing, and uh, thank you for bringing that up. Hundred percent. Hey, uh, Mitch. We had for uh, some time there quite the, cab the cascade of new, uh, news of new companies moving into the state for economic development. Uh, mm -hmm. Then there was a little pause there for a while. Is there another wave coming, or are we currently in uh, holding and negotiating status with other companies? Well, no, there's more coming. There's much more coming. Uh, that is uh, uh, a just the complete revolution that's occurring in West Virginia's business climate and our uh, uh, the recognition of that throughout the nation and the world that West Virginia has become the place to do, conduct business, raise a family, uh, and, and invest their business dollars. You know, we were in uh, Japan, Taiwan uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, that uh, – it's it's universal how appealing West Virginia has become um, as a place to invest and to uh, and to grow uh, the economy here in our state. This this is a this is the time to be uh, a West Virginia. We're going to look back on these times and these days and say, you know, uh, those were great days that West Virginia was set up for the future, and we did all that we could do in the moment we had a, the reins uh, to make this the most prosperous state in America. In interviewing folks of elected position and appointed otherwise, the theme that comes back to me as to why this is happening, and there have been many things that have pointed out, but one of those that comes up most prevalently is the repeal of the right to work laws. Mitch, has that been a selling point for you when talking to companies about moving into West Virginia? A hundred percent. I mean, I feel like I have like a very unique perspective on the evolution that's occurred in West Virginia because, you know, I was in the legislature for many years and fought for so many of these um, changes that have been in our judicial climate, in our labor laws, in our uh, education system, and uh, our regulatory environments, all those things come together. And, and, you know, somebody would criticize you at the time, say, hey, you know, you passed this law and it didn't happen. It takes a little bit of time to ferment those changes within the uh, the populations and within the the industries to see that these changes are real. And I, I can tell you, Rob, that if if we don't have those uh, statutes in place, we don't we don't have the kind of economic development that you're seeing now. And uh, so, uh, yeah, th those all uh, are important uh, toward the economic you know revolution that's occurring in West Virginia. Mitch, thank you very much for your time this morning. As always, greatly appreciated. Oh, it's my pleasure, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Uh huh. Bye.